great to see all of you here this evening. We also want to welcome those who are watching online. For those of you here, please silence your cell phones and refrain from texting for the next hour. I want to thank our lecture sponsors, Gazette Newspapers, and the Courtyard Marriott. And this lecture is also sponsored by the San Gabriel and Lower Los Angeles Rivers and Mountains Conservancy. And I want to introduce to you Mark Stanley, the Executive Director of the San Gabriel and Lower Los Angeles Rivers and Mountains Conservancy, or the RMC. Mark. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, we are delighted to support the aquarium. Recently, RMC partnered with the aquarium to sponsor the creation of an app that's about the California water feature, exhibits the Pacific Visions uh, culmination uh, gallery in tonight's lecture. Uh, going forward, RMC will sponsor several of the aquarium lectures related to California water feature and how we can make a sustainable future. So thank you, Jerry. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. It's a real pleasure to have Edward Bardier with us this evening. He's going to discuss and sign copies of his latest book, The Water Paradox, Overcoming the Global Crisis in Water Management. I've said this to a number of you already, but if I were only going to buy one book about water, this is the one. It's not only, it, it's filled with information, and it's written in a very compelling way. It tells a great story. <clears throat> Ed is a distinguished university professor in the Department of Economics at Colorado State University. He's a senior scholar in the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. Uh, before going to Colorado State, he spent a number of years at the University of Wyoming. He grew up around Chesapeake Bay um, some of the time, yeah, and uh, he got his bachelor's degree from Yale and his PhD from the London School of Economics. Has an amazing scholarly record. 24 books, more than 300 refereed journal articles, and in 2008, Cambridge University said that he was one of the 50 most influential people in the world dealing with sustainability and the environment. He's won a, a number of awards. The, how do you, is the Mazzotti, is, uh, which is an Italian prize, came with a pizza. Uh, <laughs> he's just a remarkable guy, and we're going to do some things together and uh, so please join me in welcoming Ed Barrier. And this is the book, and it will be available for signing after th the lecture. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jerry, very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jerry Schubel and the Aquarium of the Pacific for uh, inviting me here. Um, oops, what did I push wrong? Oh, I see. I got to talk a little more before the presentation comes up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I, I'll tell the story, I, which I, I've told a, a few people already, which is that I, I really didn't want to write a book about water. I work, as as Jerry said, on a lot of environmental problems. I'm an economist, so I work on it from an economics and a policy perspective. And I have done some work on water issues, but I really wasn't um, uh, that thrilled with doing a book on water because it's such a complex issue. Plus, I was aware <coughs> that there are a lot of water books already out there. And um, <coughs> uh, Yale University Press, which is the publisher, eventually convinced me and said, look, if you look at those water books, they're not really emphasizing the management side of water, the policy side, and that's your specialty. So please do for water what you've done for some of the other resources you looked at. <coughs> and so the, the result was the water paradox. And um, <coughs> I want to take you back uh, to um, Rome, Italy. Um, if you've been to Rome, uh, one of the iconic features of Rome um, uh, is their public drinking fountains. They've been around 
since the Roman times. They originally started as public watering holes and, and, and fountains uh, in markets that were in old Rome, ancient Rome. And the, the, the fountains have been in Rome for thousands of years. And they always have water. And the water is freely available. It's fresh water. And anybody can drink it, even tourists. Um, and, uh, uh, and for some people in the city, it's, it's, a, it's a source of drinking water supplies uh, that they can rely on. And, and many of these um, uh, water fountains um, go back to Roman times with maybe a little bit of uh, innovation, such as when iron came in, uh, an iron spout was put in. Uh, and so they're everywhere. And there's always been water. And it's always free, and it's always running. Um, until 2017. In 2017, in the spring and summer, Italy had one of its worst droughts. And there, then a choice had to be made. The farmers were suffering. The water that was coming to Rome for the fountains, would it go for those fountains or would it go to the farmers? And the Italian government made a decision. With the agreement of uh, the city authorities, they shut off the water to Rome's fountains. For the first time in 2,000 years, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, world wars, invasions, the water was shut off, and all because of a crisis. And that kind of water shortage and um, uh, decision in the face of a crisis is something that we're starting to see around the world. Um, and when you look at the scientific research and the projections, which uh, every year there are increasingly a number of them about the water around the world, already we're seeing that around one-third of the world's population, 2.5 billion people, live in water-scarce regions. By 2030, water scarcity could really affect and displace as many as 700 million people. So we will have water refugees in the coming decades. And then by 2050, more than half of the world's population and about half of our global grain production will be at risk due to water stress. And it's affecting all parts of the world. Uh, there's two types of scarcity. There is physical scarcity where we're actually facing constraints such as what Italy faced during the drought of 2017. And in this map, uh, the areas of extreme water scarcity and stress are already appearing. Those are the uh, red areas. Um, then there's also uh, evidence that water is available, but it's getting more and more expensive to get it from where it is to the people who need it. That's economic scarcity. That's the rising scarcity of water as we use more and more of it. That's the purple areas. And what's very interesting, when you look at these areas, of course, you have uh, classic parts of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, 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 my bad, classic parts of the, uh, oh, doesn't work. Sorry, I can't get the, anyway, my point is, is that you can see parts like the, the Western United States of rich countries that are facing uh, water scarcity, and you see highly populous rapidly industrializing, booming economies such as China, South Asia, but you're also seeing relatively poor countries in Africa, Latin America, Asia, in facing already rising costs of using water. That's the economic scarcity. So it's become a global problem in every region, rich and poor, um, uh, um, rapidly developing, industrializing, and advanced economies all are facing uh, the same problem uh, to different degrees. So what's the water paradox? I chose this as the title of the book for one reason, is that when I looked more and more at the water per problem, I was, uh, I was increasingly intrigued by a question, which is that despite the fact that we're seeing all this scientific evidence of a growing crisis in water and growing scarcity, why is the world not able to mobilize its vast wealth and ingenuity institutions to sort this crisis out. <clears throat> if water is so valuable and becoming increasingly scarce, why is it so poorly managed? It, it's the most vital resource we have. And the reason is, is that 
we persist in exploiting fresh water as if it's still abundant. We're ignoring the scarcity problem. And why we do that is because our main institutions, governments, and incentives for managing water were all formulated in a time when water was relatively abundant, and they're very inadequate for dealing with the problem of rising scarcity. And that's true in the Western United States as much as it is in India, uh, in Western China, in Australia, parts of Australia, in Senegal and Africa. We're seeing the same problem. The whole world's institutions, in incentives, innovations are all geared towards finding more water where it is and getting it to where we want to use it, treating it as if it's abundant, not scarce. So in this book, the theme of this book about the problem we have today is really a cycle of excessive water use and scarcity. It starts with poor governance, institutions, and incentives. And those poor governance mechanisms mean that we are uh, facing rising economic costs of exploiting more resources, but those rising costs aren't reflected in our markets and policies. Water's getting more scarce, but we're not seeing policies react to that scarcity, and we're not seeing markets incorporate uh, that scarcity. And what that means is that we continue to develop water, more and more supplies of existing water or available water, and we're bearing more and more excessive environmental and social damages, the costs. That in turn means that we're facing a whole host of problems, which is the heart of the scarcity problem that, that scientists tell us about. Water depletion, pollution, ecosystem degradation of the main rivers uh, and, and streams that feed our system, and of course, water scarcity itself. And because that water scarcity leads to costs that we don't see taken into account in our markets and policy, the process just repeats itself. That's the vicious cycle. And the consequence is that we see other implications that are getting to be very serious, which I document in my book. Uh, obviously, countries and regions and even cities are facing declining water sec security. There's impacts on growth that we're starting to see. Uh, water grabbing. We've heard a little bit about land grabbing where, where countries buy up land in order to grow agricultural products and export them back to their countries. Well, that's happening with water. Countries are buying up land that has access to water rights or they're buying up water rights on their own, growing water-intensive crops, and then exporting the products back because they don't have enough water in their own countries. And the countries that are wealthy enough to do that are do investing in this. Um, <clears throat> we're also, of course, with all these things going on, seeing more disputes and conflict over waters. Much of it is local, sometimes regional. Occasionally, it's over transboundary resources, water resources of rivers that cross borders or lakes as well. And then, of course, the big thing is innovation. Humans are incredibly ingenious. We're very good at innovating, developing technology. But we're not developing water-saving innovations. We're relying on the same technologies, engineering solutions, hydraulic approaches to treat water as if it was abundant, not scarce. So that's the outcome of the vicious cycle. So what I try to argue in this book is that if we want to tackle water scarcity and water use as we face it today and going into the future the next few decades, we have to reverse this. We have to introduce a virtuous cycle. And where it starts is where I started the, the, the previous cycle with our institutions, governments, that adequately address water scarcity. If we do that, then our policies and our markets will start to take into account the costs of rising water scarcity. And when that happens, we will still have water developments. We're still going to be um, um, uh, uh, allocating water, but we'll be doing it now minimizing environmental and social damages because now, the incentives will be towards water conservation, controlling water pollution, protecting valuable and essential ecosystems that supply our water, and of course, reducing water scarcity. And if we don't reduce water scarcity, our markets and policies will take it into account. So the whole process will dampen down the problem. And then we end up with reducing some of the problems I talked about before. That's where we need to go. Um, but this is, for the first time, like climate change, something that humans have to int introduce. We have to deal with this problem through 
starting with our institution, governments, and our incentives. And the end result will end up being um, reducing uh, and improving, uh, sorry, reducing conflict, support for growth, innovation that saves water, and also improve water security. <coughs> so that's the general theme of the book. Uh, I go through lots of examples. I go through lots of history as to why we ended up this way. Um, but I, I thought it'd be helpful if I went through three examples very quickly, just to illustrate both the challenges and also where we need to go. And I thought I'd come up with three examples that are relevant to the West, um, since I live there in Colorado and, and you guys live here in California. So I'm going to talk about water markets, which are something that has been um, discussed and promoted in the West for a long time. I'm going to talk about um, um, pricing of water and sanitation services for urban and residential uses. Uh, and uh, that's one of the fastest growing uses in the West is uh, for expanding cities and populations and residences. And then finally, river basin management. I live at one end of the Colorado River. In Colorado, of course. You guys are at the other end. And in fact, the Colorado River doesn't stop there. It goes all the way down to Mexico. So we have seven states in the West, and we have two countries, and we have one river. And I'm going to talk a little bit about river basin management and also um, some successes, uh, including some promising uh, uh, developments here, um, and draw some lessons from that. So <coughs> some have argued, and, s and for a long time, that if we have increasing water scarcity here in the western United States, why not develop waters, uh, markets for, for water? Uh, and markets certainly do have this potential to deal with scarcity. Um, and it will also, markets will also increase the efficiency of water use. Um, basically, the principle of water markets is straightforward. Um, if water's being used for a lower valued use, let's call it agriculture, and there's a growing new use of water, let's call it urban and residential use and industrial use, that's a higher value use. So money could be saved and water could be used more efficiently if the people who are, have excess water and are overusing it sell some of it to the higher valued users. And that would also be a case where farmers in the West fit in because farmers based to historical allocation of, of, of wa water rights, still use about 80% of the entire West's water. And most, most of it is in low-valued and highly subsidized crops, things like alfalfa, cotton, and rice. And here in California, um, uh, nuts and fruits, too. Um, <coughs> so, as I mentioned, some parties would gain if some water and alco alcohol, uh, both parties would gain, both the, the, the urban users and the agriculturalists would use, would gain if some water in agriculture is released and sold for other uses. And the, the, the evidence suggests that there is this potential gain. For example, in western states, water in urban areas is worth about $200 per acre foot, whereas on average in agriculture it's about $25. So farmers could sell some of their excess m water th that they're not using and receive revenues, and they would be more efficient in using their remaining water. And they'd have an incentive to innovate and adopt more irrigation. And as a result, uh, rather than wasting water, uh, the water would be sold at higher prices uh, in the city. That's the theory. In reality, we're seeing some water markets but they aren't widespread. There are all these gains, there's all these benefits. Why? Why are we not seeing this? Well, we are seeing some water markets, and I'll pro provide some, some, some evidence in a, in a minute that, that's a little more encouraging. But, but generally, the problem is that water markets, if, where they do exist, generally are local or within a state. There are very little private water trading. There's very little private water trading across state lines, and there is a whole range of state regulatory restrictions uh, to the cost of doing this. And in fact, there's a lot of restrictions on selling water in general, if you're a farmer. Um, there's also the cost of transporting water large distances. 
Um, and um, we don't have the infrastructure. The infrastructure so far has been getting water from, that's not used by farmers, to the cities. We have not been investing in water infrastructure that can get water from farmers uh, and then off to the cities. Uh, <coughs> um, another problem is um, the legal uncertainty. There's a lot of legal issues here. Uh, and all these uh, restrictions, regulations, uh, in some cases uh, in the state of Nor uh, in northern Colorado, there was restrictions on selling water to uh, growing cities. Uh, and so, in fact, the city of Thornton, which wanted to buy water from uh, farmers further to the west, they actually had to uh, create their own farms and qualify as an agricultural concern in order to get that water. And even still, it took them 10 or 15 years to get that through the state re legislature. Uh, uh, eventually, it happened. And they now have abandoned those uh, farms. <laughs> uh, um, um, and, but here's the real problem. The problem is, is the type of water rights that we have is called use it or lose it, or prior appropriation. A farmer is, who has first rights to the land, to the water, sorry, um, is given an allocation of so much water. If the farmer does not use all that water, or most of it, then the farmer might lose that right, and it'll go to the next farmer or the next user in line. So the farmer has the incentive to use as much water as possible. Not only that, in some states, selling it to somebody else is not considered a good use of the water. Even though it's economic, even though it's going to make the farmer money, the water is there to grow agricultural crops or to ranch. And then on top of that, um, all these things uh, uh, have been layered with more regulations to control water use for environmental reasons. So we've come along, seen a system that doesn't work in terms of an incentive to, to use water, when we want to restrict water use by the farmers, so we hit them with a whole bunch of environmental regulations. Say, so you can't do this, you can do that. You have to watch for dry season flow versus uh, so forth. You have to have so much return water going back and so forth. But changing the incentives and the, and the basic right allocation and the, and the right to do it has been a, a problem. Um, a final problem is that Often it's not the farmers that own the water, it's the actual irrigation district. As long as the farmer or the uh, rancher is using the water, the farmer has the right to it. But if the farmer decides not to use it, it goes back to the irrigation district because it's irrigation water. And the district then won't sell it to the cities or industries. It, it'll sell it to another farmer or allocate it to other farmers that are staying in practice. Um, so. Many of these discussions of water markets in the West, the farmers look like the bad guys. But what I'm trying to tell you is don't blame the farmers. They are just responding as rational actors to the incentives, institutions, and governments, including regulation, that they're faced with. And <coughs> although in principle in the West, separating water from land rights means that you, you can sell the water without having to sell your land, what I've just described to you is there's every incentive for farmers not to, to sell their water, or even just a part of it, which is what many of them want to do. So what do they do? They overuse the water on their land. Hence, we end up with water being overused in crops and subsidies and other farm inducements to encourage more production just leads to more water use and less value for that water by farmers. <coughs> and the main reason is that every one of these things points to the same incentive. Farmers had the incentive to use as much of their water as possible, of their water rights, that is, or risk losing uh, that right. And as I pointed out, it might not be the right anyway. It could, if they don't use it, it goes right back to the irrigation district. Well, as you can imagine, this leads to both inefficient and excess use of water, but it also means that farmers can't decide to parcel out some of their water and sell some of it, the part that they're not going to use. And then on top of that, we have climate change. And what climate change has done is it means for the whole agricultural system in the West, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. Droughts are more frequent. There are more violent storms. 
there's uh, more flooding in parts of the West, uh, e even in, in, in the, um, I mean, all, all the tension in recent years is on the, uh, the Central West, in the Midwest, but even in um, uh, the Far West and, and the, the Mountain West, Intermountain West, we're also seeing variable weather patterns and not just droughts, but also floods and so forth. And with that situation, that, that, that basically encourages far farmers even more to hold on to the water and as a hedge against future drought problems. And that makes sense. Now, despite all of this, that gap still remains between the price of water that agriculture are get, farmers are getting for it by using it on their crops in such an excessive way, and the growing demand and higher value for water in cities. So there is evidence that water markets are spreading. So that's the good news. It's starting to happen. We're starting to think this is not the right Set of incentives we want, we have to think. And, and there's um, a number of states are experimenting with different mechanisms to, to address this issue. Um, there's, of course, the direct transfer where you just buy the water out. Unfortunately, this tends to be the case where a farmer is going out of business anyway and wants to give up farming or ranching and so then is willing, if the law allows, to sell the right. Um, indirect transfers are also occurring. Where, um, where it's allowed, you can buy shares in an irrigation district if they're the ones that hold the rights, and, or in the network to gain access to the water resources. Some environmental groups are doing this, and all, all, all some uh, cities as well. Um, um, <coughs> and, and the idea then is to have a sharing agreement with the district and network, so the district or network retains the overall right, but the farmer, uh, sorry, the other uses of water buy a share of that right and then can use it uh, and then, of course, the other popular thing is leasing rights, is not selling it, but renting essentially it out. One of my favorite innovations in the West is water banks. And um, water banks are, are like ordinary banks. That, um, in a sense, a water bank is where you can deposit some of your excess water uh, from multiple suppliers, and mainly farmers and ranchers and so forth, for future use. Uh, or you could lend and sell that excess. So this is good for farmers because it means that they can bank the water and then get credit back from that bank for water when they need it in drought times. And that reduces their uncertainty. If they, uh, with respect to climate change and future droughts in particular. But if the water um, is not being used in over a period of time, then the water bank can then send, uh, lend it out, give credit to other users, whether they're environmental groups who want to keep water back in the original source, like a stream or a river, or whether it's to uh, local cities and um, industrial users. So it, it works just like an ordinary bank, but it's using water as the currency. Um, so here's some of the evidence uh, 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 that's come from a, a study that was published a number of years ago, and there's nothing to suggest, uh, everything I've seen is that these trends are continuing even from then, is that what this, this, this study looked at um, uh, trades of water, and what they found is that m where mar water markets are occurring in the West, they're going in the right direction. We're starting to see transfer of water from a lower valued use to higher value uses. And how do we know that? Because the right prices for agriculture to urban trades are higher than they are from farmer to farmer trades. And the other thing we're seeing is that water trades are increasingly occurring for longer periods of time. It's not just short-term lending or leasing, but we're actually making these, change, th sorry, these trades through multi-year leases or through sales of the water right. And increasingly, the sales of the water right is not just uh, the entire right being sold when farms go out of business, but parceling up the water from the irrigation districts and the farmers, part of the water, and selling it on a permanent basis. And what's the, probably the most encouraging thing is that the states with the highest urban growth appear to be making the most water transactions. So despite all the institutional problems and the governance problems and the regulatory problems, it's starting to happen and that's encouraging. Okay. <clears throat> the second example I wanted to talk about is water once it gets to the city. And the biggest use of water in, in, in urban areas is for uh, um, w uh, household water use and sanitation services. Uh, drinking water primarily or, or, or private use of water. And what you find universally around the world, particularly even in rich countries, and this is a graph of rich countries, is that the two main costs of supplying that water, we don't pay for it. 
users don't pay much for it. Um, now, much of that is, of course, heavy investment by public utilities and governments, and in many places, um, including Japan, uh, but certainly the United States, more than 50% of the water of invested in the infrastructure that delivers water to consumers, more than 50 to, to percent, and even in some cases 100%, is paid for by the government. Okay, that's a big public investment, we know that. Uh, it's expensive to do that infrastructure. But what's really surprising is the operational costs. So water is a flow, and you have pipes. You have to get it from where it uh, is stored to where it's going to be used, and you have to maintain that system of piping and delivery and all that. And even here, the prices we pay as consumers are rarely, except in uh, places like France and Japan, rarely paid for by consumers. In the United States, it's probably about 50%. <coughs> That's starting to change. Um, and what we're starting to see is pricing is starting to come in more and more in localities, cities, and other urban areas. And if the ending of this underpricing, particularly for operation and maintenance and s for covering some of the investment costs, that could have three benefits. It would obviously improve cost recovery. Um, those costs would start to be paid for, and that would help uh, maintain and expand the system and make it more efficient. It would lead to, of course, more water conservation because people are now paying higher prices for water. They would start to conserve more. One of the interesting questions you've got to ask is why do we have domestic appliances that are Energy Star appliances where you get bonuses for, but we don't have it for water? You can buy a washing machine and get a, uh, and get a, 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 and you will choose it maybe because of the Energy Star program to get a very efficient washing machine, but it could use tons of water and you wouldn't even know it and you wouldn't have to, 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 to face the consequences of that. Um, and the other thing is that um, you can design the pricing system in a way that would actually improve equity for low-income families. And the way in which this could be done, and is increasingly being done, and, and most cities in the West are starting to do this in one way or the other, is what's called a two-tier pricing system. In fact, some cities have moved to a multi-tier pricing system. And the, and the process is really simple, is that there should be a fixed service charge that per month to cover operating and maintenance costs. So consumers are paying more of that last type of cost I identified. But there should also be a second tier block rate charge on per unit of water used per month. And what that would mean is that if you set the water uh, of the first charge sufficiently low enough to cover the, 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 the price of, uh, to make it affordable for low income households. So basically, for households that would on average use 20 cubic meters for water, would tend to be low income households, you would set a lower price, let's say $2 per cubic meter. But then for people who use water above that amount, tend to be higher income, uh, uh, and you set a higher price. In multi-tier pricing, you would have several levels. And what would that mean? It would mean that people who are filling up swimming pools, um, uh, uh, buying you know, six toilets and, and three bathrooms or you know, whatever, you know, and, and uh, uh, s saunas and um, uh, hot tubs and jacuzzis along with their um, other items, um, they, they, would, they can do that, but they'd be paying more for water. And as a result, we'd have more cost recovery. And that's true also for waste and sanitation. Um, so a multi-tier pricing for domestic water services could, as I say, cover, recover some of the costs and also um, be done in a way that's more fair for low-income households and also could be used in a way so that some of the subsidies could be back. We could have a rebate for low-income houses, houses for water charges just like we have for energy charges in some places. The last thing I want to talk about very briefly um, is river basin management. Um, as I mentioned, um, we, we, we all live in this room in, in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, and this long run trend shows, uh, this, I'm, I'm afraid it stops at 2010, but it, it's still continuing on, has shown that um, water supply, which is the purple line from the Colorado River Basin or through it, hasn't really changed very much 
but water use has gone up and up and up. And we're now at the point with the new compact and everything coming in that we are facing scarcity. So um, there, the seven states that, that, that uh, constitute the Colorado River Basin are all facing this problem. And this is an important basin. It supports 40 million people, 4 million areas, acres of irrigated agriculture, and accounts for about 27% of our nation's GDP. So economically and socially, it's an incredibly important river basin. We have got to come together and work out how to manage this, this precious resource of this river. It's central to uh, no other river in the United States has this kind of uh, economic, social, and even environmental characteristics. And, and although it's too early um, uh, to know what the new compact means, I haven't uh, looked at it in great detail, um, but there's, start, there's a start to, to thinking about the whole bis basin. And um, one of the interesting things is that uh, the Colorado River Basin, as I talk about in the book, is one of four basins where also critical parts of the world, where things are starting to happen, where we're starting to think about whole river basin management. And of course, with the Colorado River, we have the added problem that it crosses into Mexico. So we also have uh, uh, negotiated deals with, with Mexico. Um, and what's interesting is that there was a catalyst for reform for each one of the management. In the United States, in the Colorado River Basin, it really started with environmental concerns. But the problem is, is that there's multiple jurisdictions that have to coordinate actions across the basin. It's starting to happen. Um, the downside is that there's limited, right for now, use of water markets to allocate water both within and between states. And I think that has to change. There is some experimentation with water banks all along in different parts of the Colorado River. And I think that trend is going to continue. And there's also increasingly thinking about what happens to the water as we save it, where it goes to the cities, and what cities should get, wha get what. And of course, you can look at these other three examples, and you can see the same thing. There's always big catalyst for form. And then the question is, do we try to coordinate across multiple jurisdictions? Or in the case of some of them, like the, uh, the Murray-Darling River, do we have a single basin authority that takes overlap o overall jurisdiction over the river basin? That's a novel concept. I'm not suggesting the Colorado River should go there. I think it would be very difficult. We have a different political system. Uh, but nonetheless, um, there's encouraging signs uh, here that we're starting to think of the entire basin. Um, there's a lot of insights when you look at river basin management around the world that's worth thinking about. Um, this is where crises can be good, provided they're not too devastating and too long run. As that previous table showed, that crises can provide a catalyst for reform. Uh, in the case of uh, the Murray, River, uh, Murray Darling River Basin in Australia, it was a major drought in Australia that, that led to the catalyst. Um, uh <coughs> What's also very interesting is that all these river basin managements have actually extended the concept of water use to environmental use, or really non-use. So, all these river basin plans are starting to take on board, including here at the Colorado River, non-use of water, or, or keeping water, some of the water back in the systems to that, such as they are uh, left, to try and improve the state of the freshwater ecosystems that support the system. And that means evaluating trade-offs between uh, consumptive and in-stream environmental uses, and that's increasingly happening. Um, <coughs> increasingly, um, all these river basin management uh, actions, whether they are uh, cooperation between jurisdictions or a single basin authority, are starting to develop water management plans along the entire river basin. And <coughs> uh, again, the, the plans are, are taking into account not just the competing water uses, agriculture, urban, and industrial, but also uh, in-stream uses for environmental benefits such as recreation uh, and just amenity values in general. Um, and the other interesting thing is that these plans, this approach, is one of the reasons we're starting to see water markets spring up. Here in the United States, it's happening more locally and within state, but increasingly there's hope that it could happen on a much bigger scale. Uh, <coughs> uh, ultimately, um, one has to think about centralizing or at least nesting water governance structures within basin-wide ma management institutions 
and we have to think about how that would affect our water allocations and how we can use scientific knowledge and new technologies. Um, one of the technologies we have to think about is the connection between surface water and groundwater and how those two can be allocated together within river basins. Um, it's, it's a big task, but we have the better, better technology, remote sensing, LIDAR, and so forth, to do that. And, and in, here in the West, uh, in Arizona and other places, they're starting to do that. So here's the bottom line. We have built up a huge vested interest in keeping our water institutions, governments, and management the way it is. And those vested interests have a lot of political clout. So the biggest obstacle to all of this, of adapting our management of water to an age of scarcity, is going to be political. Political will and political leadership. Um, it's not just the White House or the federal government. It's many states in the United States and local jurisdictions have, jurisdictions have a lot of uh, say in this. Uh, and whether we have the political will, we can to do this, um, we shall see. But increasingly, there has been growing interest in how do we manage out of this crisis problem. Um, and I'd like to end by talking about what the average citizen can do. Because ultimately, in a country like ours, it comes down to people, individuals, and their institutions. Well, the first thing is stay informed and engaged. If you are interested in this problem, if you're concerned about it, keep finding out more about it. Read my book. No. <laughs> That's one way you can be informed. Uh, but there's other things. Um, uh, ask a simple question. Where does the water in my tap come from? How much is it coming from a new water source, like a river or a reservoir? How much of it's come from recycling of, of water within the city or, or suburb that I live in the public utility? Most people don't know. They turn on the tap, the water comes out. That's all they care about until the pipe breaks and they have to call up their utility. Or they fail to pay, pay their bill and the water gets cut off. We have three powerful influences in this, in this um, country. We have an influence as a voter, a consumer, and a shareholder. And many of us, maybe some of us don't, don't have shares, but we have some impact but we can ask some questions here, too. Like, how are our local policymakers, water utilities, and even major corporations that are in our localities, how are they dealing with this? Um, what are our, pol our policymakers aware of the scarcity problem? What do they think of how it should be managed? It's your right as a voter to ask those questions. Water utilities, the same thing. Look at your water bill. How are they pricing your water? Do you think they're doing it the right way? You think it's doing the wrong way? Well, you may not know, but you can ask them. So, say, uh, do you have a two-tier pricing system? Do you have a three-tier pricing system? How are you charging for sanitation services? Does it include maintenance costs? How do you pay for water leaks and breaks in the system that delivers pipes to my house? Do I pay for it? Do you pay for it? What is it costing you? That kind of thing. And local corporations, ask them, do you have a plan for water scarcity? You're in California. You're in Colorado. It's an arid and semi-arid region. You're telling me you haven't thought about a water plan for your corporation? Don't you want the corporation to stay in business in 2030, 2050? Ask them. How are you contributing to the city's water problem, my local problem? And then this is really interesting. Um, in the process of writing this book, I came, I, I've done a number of interviews. I've done a number of, uh, most of it in the West, much of it in the West, I should say. And I've learned an awful lot. Some things I've put in the book and some things I learned since then. But there's an awful lot of things that are going on at the local level that I wasn't aware of. Some cases I was. And I, I just want to share a few of them because they've made some big differences. Um, in this, in uh, the last drought in California, of course, I write about it in the book, there was, that was a catalyst for major reform of California's groundwater law, which was long overdue. It went from completely no regulations and now we have regulations on groundwater here. That's a great thing. But there were some small things that happened. The city of Santa Cruz started to do the normal thing, you know, ban host pipes, you know, say you can't water your, your grass, you know, can't fill up your swimming pool, which were generally ignored. But then they decided, 
well, what if we just suggest that we have water pricing? We start charging water. We just start doing it. And the local people responded. They said, yeah. And they ended up cutting their water use dramatically. They exceeded their targets. Rather than going for the old regulations, they said, to, to achieve our targets for reducing water use during this drought, we'll use pricing, and it worked, and it happened. And they, they, they've continued on. Um, Provo, Utah, U, sorry, Provo, Provo, Utah, um, they have a, a multi-tier block pricing system, which they explained to me during a water interview I had with the local NPR station. And basically, um, it's a very interesting system. And it makes sense. Provo is a, is a ski town. And they get most of their water from the snowpack. It's totally unreliable. It's variable. Provo is booming. So many yuppies want to go there to ski live there. Very rich people want to go. So they said, we got people, and we got people who, who service the, the ski industry, who are local workers. So we got to come up with a multi-tier pricing so that we can protect the people at the low end of the scale who, who are getting minimum wage or, or you know, very much, not very much. Uh, so they, and, but also charge for, for these, these, um, these ski chalet users that are using an awful lot of water. And that's what they've done, and it seems to be working. Two innovations from Las Vegas. Las Vegas is very interesting. They, they, they've quietly revolutionized their water use in, in Southern Nevada Water District, which includes Las Vegas. And one of the things they did, which was very interesting, as I mentioned, this is a semi-arid, arid ecosystem. Grass doesn't grow here unless you plant turf or you basically resoil your land and then plant seeds. So we have tons of turf, of grass turf, all over the West. So what Las Vegas said, we're a desert. We don't need to have turf everywhere. So they started to buy back turf. And they basically played, paid any uh, a household, a school, a city uh, park, uh, um, a golf course, paid, the, not, no, they didn't buy the green state grass, but you know, the areas around the greens uh, were bought back and planted at $2 per square foot. They paid. $2 per square foot, the, the local utility. That's a lot of money. And then um, if the entity saved water, they would get some money back as well. What happened was is that the city cut its water use uh, by a tremendous amount, and places like schools, um, uh, some elementary schools that did this, got one of them got $10,000. They used that to um, not only... Uh, um, recede with native uh, um, drought-resistant local vegetation from uh, desert uh, ecosystem vegetation, um, but um, I should say n native vegetation. But they also used that money in order to develop um, uh, a, a, a little vegetable garden with uh, water-saving drip irrigation for their students. The elementary school students drew their own, uh, drew their own food, and then they went to the local market and sold it. And they learned both how to, to become agriculture users, how to save water, and also um, they learned from the, uh, the marketing uh, experience. Uh, the other thing that Las Vegas has done is tried to move towards more reuse of water. They get their water from Lake Mead, as you can imagine, because they don't have enough water there. And so they have tried to increase how much water is retained within the system. And one of the things they had to deal with is the leakages. Every urban system, no matter how big the city, has a huge problem with pipes leaking. This, it's like a, a, a colander, most of the pipes. They're old. Or, and in desert areas, or semi-arid and arid areas, it's even worse. Um, uh, and of course, you can't see the water when it leaks out. So the Water Authority invested in this entire SWAT team for water leaks. And they basically go around, one guy goes, uh, one group goes uh, with ultrasound and listens, regularly checks neighborhoods, um, even if it's not reported a leak, to see whether they can detect leaks under down, ground. If they find a leak, then another team comes in, immediately digs up, fix the pipe, and within the same day, often within the, s the same hour, as soon as those guys leave, another crew comes, to, if it's a road or a, a sidewalk, and fixes it up. So by the end of the day, you have no idea what's going on. They have cut their water use 30% by doing this. And they've saved a lot of money. And they, of course, can employ all these people in these tasks. So that's just some of the ideas that we can do. These are innovations. It's water saving. 
But we have to manage our water. We have to treat it as it is, which is a growing scarce water. Once we reach that point and we start to demand that from ourselves, from our policymakers, and from our water managers, then things will start to change. It's starting to happen. We need to see it happen much more quickly to deal with these crises as they start to arise. Thanks very much. Um, let, I'm interested, you spent a number of years in Wyoming, and yes. uh, <laughs> a lot of cattle. You know, cattle, and we've got five million beef cattle in California, mm -hmm. two million dairy cattle, mm -hmm. average cow. A lot of cow, and sheep, don't forget the sheep. Yeah, yeah, right. The average cow, though, drinks 20 to 25 gallons a day. That's a lot of water. You, alfalfa? Well, well uh, just back <laughs> off a bit, a little bit. There's a little difference, I mean, just, I mean you're absolutely right, but be careful on your numbers there, because much of the the, uh, the 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 use of at least for part of the season of ranchers in Wyoming is free range cattle. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking yeah. about California. And yeah. Oh, I, California. You're back. Ca California. We're yeah. away from we're, Wyoming. You're back. Yeah. In we're California. back to okay. California. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, and, and that's an yeah. awful lot of water. I, is it going to take a, a real crisis to change this? Now, Kevin Waterier is in the back there. Kevin. Wa Kevin was the the, the uh, general manager of the Long Beach Water for a number of years, and he was a pioneer in getting rid of lawns and replacing with drought-tolerant vegetation. I nice one, Kev. So, what, is it going to take a, a real crisis to make something happen in, of significance in California? Well, that's a good question, Jerry. Um, well, the, the, you know, as I pointed out r early in my talk, um, alfalfa is one of those yeah. low-valued, highly subsidized crops, and it only exists for one reason, which is to feed, to feed cattle. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, um, and it uses a, uh, I cite in my book the actual statistic, but it's 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 something like 20% of the water of California just for one crop, maybe right. more, maybe right. a quarter. I think this is an area where um, we have to think carefully about governance institutions and incentives. Yeah. Um, and the state of California has an obligation, I think, to its citizens to relook at the whole alfalfa uh, ca cattle f equation here in this state. Right. Um, again, I'm not an expert on California water. Um, I know many people who are. And um, I think it's one of those um, distortions that's, that's just layered with so many problems. You have the normal ones that we talked about. And there are other higher valued crops that some of alpha farmers could grow. That's right. The consequences, however, is that the beef industry is not going to like it. Uh, and consumers may not like it. Uh, but, but to be, be, be honest, I bet you much of the beef consumed in California actually doesn't come from California. Um, uh, but uh, and uh, much of the alfalfa gets exported to China to feed the cattle. Right, and um, that's right. Alfalfa gets exported elsewhere. I mean, and the other crop that, of course, comes comes up to mind is soybeans. That's another feed yeah. crop for other other livestock. And again, much of that's exported. Much of it goes to countries that are exporting that that are importing it for their growing agriculture and their growing consumers. So, it, 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 in a nutshell, it's a California problem. It's also a global, pro uh, national problem, and it's a global problem. And it's one that we have to. Um, uh, a crisis might be the one, the catalyst that drives it. And the but, someone, but the change that we want to see, um, we need to s to work all the parties together to develop a, a strategy and plan plan through right. it and to say this is not sustainable. How do we move from where we are now to where we want to be, and what does it look like? Yeah, and someone and who gains said, and who never, loses. Never waste a good crisis. Go right. ahead. Hmm. Do you find that one of the forces of economic, social, environmental, do one of these kind of start something and at the same point, can you find that one of those three becomes the weak link? Like there's something yeah. more important than the other two. Like absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, 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 and that's certainly the case w w when, when you've seen movements towards better river management. As in Colorado River Basin, um, the impetus I'm not saying the solution, but the impetus for change came from powerful environmental groups wanting, a, wanting to say, hey, we, we, we should have a say in how the Colorado River Basin is managed. And that meant that the, that, that the various states that started to think about uh, um, the environmental in-stream values and the values both for local people and for very powerful growing industries like recreation and tourism, 
um, how do those balance with the other uses of water? That's how, now I'm not saying environmentalists have the solution, I'm just saying that was the catalyst. Um, in other parts of the world, it's been things like a major drought. That was what happened in, in Australia and uh, to some extent in, um, uh, in the, the, the river in, in, in China. That then there can be a major political upheaval. For example, in South Africa, it, it was the end of apartheid that, 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 that three things up. Um, um, but the catalyst starts things going. What you have to do then has have the, the have the correct uh, planning and thinking about how do we manage all these competing uses and how do we uh, think about uh, thinking about across jurisdictions and thinking about a long term plan and where we want to be from here, let's say in 20 years or 10 years, and that that takes some kind of leadership authority uh, or at least consensus, um, and um, and much of it is coming from. Certain actors, certainly, I mean, it's interesting what, what Las Vegas is trying to do. They realized they actually literally ran out of water in the 90s uh, at one point, and they just decided we have to change what we're doing. Uh, and so they have moved in a different direction, and they're a pretty major city. Um, I think that other cities here in California are going to start doing the same thing if they haven't already. And Phoenix is also moving. I mean, all these are, are, are entities that are part of the Colorado River Basin. In Colorado, Fort Collins, Boulder, Denver, um, th they're leading the charge to deal with the upper part of the Colorado River, off the Poudre River tributary. I gave this talk, um, I was invited to give this talk to the Poudre River Forum, which brought together stakeholders from industry, from agriculture, from uh, environmental groups, and from the state uh, and, and the local uh, water district authority uh, to discuss these things. Uh, and get the process. So getting people talking, getting the different actors at the same table to discuss how to do it, not easy, it's difficult. And it's also difficult to get different states together. Once the compact is signed, that's not the end of the story, that's the beginning of it. How do you manage, you know? Anyway, thank Go ahead, Francis, question. nice and loud. Yeah. And then we'll have to thank you. That's a great question, and that's the question you should ask your your water utility. And uh, uh, and so I think we should ask Kevin. Yeah, Kevin, why do you have that question? As to but there's another issue here, which is that <laughs> if you if you if you compare American toilets with toilets in places like Japan or Europe or so, our toilets use way much more water, and it doesn't matter where you are, whether you are in uh, in in, um, in you know in Pennsylvania or in California. Pennsylvania has plenty of water, uh, maybe too much at times. Uh, California, times we don't have enough water here. Um, and yet our toilets use huge amounts of water every time we flush it. We have no incentive to adopt appliances in our houses that would use less water and innovate. Similarly with the farmers, they don't have enough incentive. Some of them are doing it on their own or they have some incentives provided by local uh, water and irrigation districts to use m more water saving technologies. Um, but if water became higher priced and you know more valuable, then we would start reusing more of it. And we would have better systems for recovering wastewater, whether it's from farms or from, from houses, and treating it and then putting it right back into the system. There's nothing to say that the water system couldn't be more efficient in, in, in use and reuse. There is one already. Yeah. You, you, there's ones already that you can you flush it one way, go up and and, and and you would use a little bit, and then you could flush it another way, use a little bit more. You can do a simple thing like put a brick in your your thing. I'm serious. Yeah. You put a brick in it, and 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 it actually uses less water. Yeah.
Right, and that's, that's the interesting issue is the laws are there. The question is why aren't people using more of it? And that has to do with the fact that the water that's coming into their houses, well, it's, it, they're not paying the full price for that and the services that go with it. Thank you. So, so thank you for that. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to write it, because I knew it was so hard to do. <laughs> no, no, so thank I, you. I acknowledge your courage. You've been embarking on this. Journey. Yeah, and foolishness, you know, foolishness. No, no, it was, a, it was a stretch, and yeah. we've done an amazing job. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, one thing I wanted to get is you were talking about this, the, the markets. And mm. Excellent question. And you know, my view on this is that if you have the right institutions and incentives, the right innovations will follow. And I don't know what they are. I'm not, that's not my area of expertise. It's on more of the management, the policies, uh, and the uh, incentive side. That's because I'm an economist. I'm not an engineer or a hydrologist. Um, um, I don't know, and I'm not a financial innovator either. I mean, I, I don't know what role there might be for some of the things you mentioned, but there could be. And the point is, is that if it helps us at the end of the day save water and, uh, and pay the right price for it, or at least a, uh, something that, that, that reflects its scarcity, then we're moving in the right direction. So and we'll see that, transact. excuse me? It would allow you to transact, right? And in a different way than it's being done now. Yeah, well, all I can say is, I, I, you know, I see this invention here. How many people would have predicted this, you know, in 2000? Right? I don't know what the innovation will be. This has revolutionized our lives, maybe in a good way, maybe in a bad way. Uh, same with the internet. Um, I don't know what the innovations will be. That's not my area. I'm not a Stephen Jobs. You know, I'm just a simple economist who, who thinks about incentives. Yeah. Uh, but maybe you'll come up with that innovation that you're talking about, or you know somebody who will, and get them thinking about it. Uh, once, once this, that's why we have to, I really appreciate your question, because we have to stay engaged and informed and think about this through, and everybody has a ro role to play in all this. It's not that the farmers are bad. It's not that the engineers are bad. It's not that the economists are bad. We're just not all on the same page because we don't have the right incentives and management and signals in the market that, that we need to have. And once we, we start tackling those problems, then I think we, the others will start to happen. This is a great innovative great. economy. Well, here's the problem. Uh, up to now, interbasin water transfers have been thinking about one thing, which is the, the, the cheapest way of getting water from A to B. They haven't thought about the economic, social consequences of that. Um, and this is something that Colorado, northern Colorado, is dealing with right away with, with, with the, uh, that part of the Colorado River, and particularly the Poudre River. And um, the, increasingly, however, stakeholders are demanding to take these things into consideration. And we're starting to see uh, assessments done of the ecological consequences of, of, of interbasin or even inter-river transfers. Um, uh, we're starting to see people questioning uh, whether the costs are all taken into account and, and what the implications are. We're also recognizing that maybe this is very similar to the problem we're seeing with congestions and traffic on roads, 
which is that uh, basically we can add another lane to our highway, but it's gonna fill up right again. The only way to control traffic is to price it at peak times and people pay for it. That's the only way. And the same thing with water. At some point we have to bite that bullet and pay for water, what it costs us. And those costs might be just, not just the cost of diverting water, it's the cost of what that transfer might mean in terms of other costs, including short and long run. So, yeah, and people yeah. are starting to look into that. We just need to translate that into thinking seriously about water. I think one of the things that is lacking here in California are institutional mechanisms to inject into the policy making process. Yeah. Science and policy analysis, like you do. You're a policy analyst, mm. but you're not a policy maker. No. Now those are our elected and appointed officials. And it's, it's hard to inject any science or policy analysis into the process in California until after a policy is made and then everybody's protecting their turf. We also have a tendency to, to just keep doing the same thing over right. and over again, which is to layer another set of regulations. Right. We see a problem, more regulation. Right. And then we end up with, uh, what we, what, as I mentioned before, what economists call transaction costs. If we wanna actually transfer something like water from farmers to selling water, f farmers selling water to, to cities, we suddenly find tons of regulations prevent that. Even though those regulations were meant to be good things, like to protect the environment of the freshwater ecosystems and in stream use, or, or to ensure that farmers have enough water during drought. Um, it, 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 we, and that's become a problem. And, and, I, and I don't want to underestimate the difficulty that policymakers face in trying to unraveling that. But you're absolutely right, Jerry, unless that we have more informed policy analysis with policymakers, with stakeholders, all talking and exchanging ideas and thinking how do we deal with this, then we can do it. Some of the local examples I've talked about and many that everyone knows here uh, in California, um, there are success stories. We have to find them right. and learn from them. Yeah, thank you for a great talk and uh, he will be available to autograph a book for you and uh, <laughs> over in the bookstore, okay. Thank you, Ed, very much. Thank you,